So Jill and Sarah, this uh, idea has been with you for a long time. What about it struck you when you first read it and made you say, all right, we have to take this to television? Yeah, good question. I mean, I had never read or thought about a married couple nestled in 14 years of maybe just like a slumbery time with their sex life when the wife decides, oh my gosh, I've just met somebody I really want to have sex with and she tells her husband, that husband would say, tell me more, babe, tell me more. And is there anything I can do to help? And that whole idea, that that dynamic kind of really woke us up. And it's interesting, you see this woman through the course of this show taking charge of her life and of her art. Uh, talk about exploring that throughout the season. Yeah, I mean, I think we try to conflate the feeling of sexual desire and becoming an artist. And Chris is not really sure which is happening to her. Is she falling in love? Is she getting turned on? Or is she finding her artist's voice? And for a lot of women, um, that feeling of being shut down, they're, they're sort of connected and, and finding your voice and finding the opportunity to say, here I am, to be the subject instead of the object, mm -hmm. especially when we live in a world that's so patriarchal, that recently got more patriarchal. Um, I think it's just like really an exciting, for me it's really exciting as a creator to think about women popping this show on. You know what email I get from women who have th snuck it to? Mm -hmm. I feel like this show was made just for me. Just for me. Yeah. And women are watching it and feel feel like they're seeing somebody that speaks exactly to who they are, mm -hmm. um, and that's just like that's a dream come true for us. What were some of the challenges in adapting <coughs> the book to the screen? Some major changes that you made. I don't think there were challenges. I think it was just a, it, the challenges of writing a series is always about really being true to character, really making sure that the that this that what we're exploring in this sexual dynamic may, remains taught and that we keep turning it and keep, you know, keep diving a little bit deeper into the unexpected and keep being as fearless and, and you know, like relentless about chasing Dick as Chris <laughs> is. <laughs> she just had chasing Dick. <laughs> Could have said worse, but yes, yeah. Yeah, I think that's. I mean, I think that's that's the, that's what the that's the that's what the that's the invitation. And we also just to we also added some characters. Yeah, we added characters. Yeah, we added <laughs> three characters that weren't in the book. But because who wants to watch a television show that doesn't have as many voices and many representations of sexuality and gender and you know class as possible? You know, this is yeah, 2017, folks. Yeah. Certainly the, the casting and the show is, is a big part of its success. Uh, you've worked with Katherine Hahn before on uh, Transparent and I think some other things. Yeah. Um, what made her right for Chris? I think she's probably one of the greatest actresses of our time. I Sometimes I call her Dame Katherine Hahn to her face. <laughs> um, and then I think she's also got like a Charlie Chaplin-esque yeah. clownishness where she embodies sexual awkwardness in a way that I've never seen anybody do. You're really like giggling for her and you feel her yearning and you feel her getting in the way of herself, the way she uses her body. Yeah. She's just, she's, 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 she's a national treasure. Yeah. She's, she, she cracked us up just walking across a room. Yeah. On multiple takes. Yeah. Um, so, here you And then Kevin Bacon and Griffin Dunn you know, rounding out this train. What the heck? <laughs> How'd we get Kevin Bacon? Yeah. And how lucky to have Griffin Dunn. Griffin Dunn. Dunn. I'm getting credited with, with reviving his career. I mean, <laughs> there's see, his I did what Scorsese couldn't. <laughs> 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 well played, son of the way. <laughs> well played. <laughs> um, well, one of the other great qualities of this show is its setting in Martha, Texas. Yeah. I set it there. Yeah, we collection. love scorpions. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> two varietals. No, um, it, it's a town that is a just a very interesting culture uh, petri dish, your biosphere. I don't know what you call it. Um, there's art. There's ranchers. There's border patrol. There's hipsters. There's it's desert oil money. Rats. Yeah, oil yeah. money. Oil money, and it's all existing in one little tiny two thousand. Um, person town with one stoplight and two different um, gas stations with tacos.
all these people end up at the same bar every night. And we also did and had drinks with them. Yes. It's well, very fun. It also provides you as a director with a lot of landscape. And interesting yes. To Beautiful light. Yes. Yeah. Open, open sky, big, huge sky, big, huge landscape. Really exciting. I mean, this is a place where they shot Giant. They shot There Will Be Blood. Um, no else? Country? Right. No Country for All Men. Yeah. All of these movies, these iconic movies about masculinity were shot there. And of course, it's the home of Donald Judd, and he's an iconic artist who speaks to masculinity. So for us to bring this very feminist, female, rabble-rousing show into Marfa just felt like, you know, just kind of driving our, our little uh, revolutionary yeah. feminist clown car into straight into patriarchy. <laughs> it's a Chinese fire drill of a show, actually. <laughs> Um, you've won two Emmys for directing for Transparent Two in a row. You know, um, you, you made me very anxious on Gold Derby where you guys said that if I re won a third, I would be making history. Well, uh, I didn't mean to make you anxious. <laughs> oh, that was you who said that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm always uh, predicting, but yeah. Okay. Um, I just, I'm curious what that recognition has meant to you. It's amazing. I mean, it's crazy, especially when I think about the speed from which I went from feeling a little bit lost and like a wannabe, which was maybe as recently as four years ago, and then forcing myself to confront my fears and direct a short and then direct a feature, and it's crazy. You sit in there in the audience and they call out your name and you go up on stage and you get the award and I'm a non-athletic person, <laughs> so this is for me like you know sports. It's like it's a tro. It's a tro yeah. I, it's March a Madness. Deal. Yeah, it's it's yeah. It's, In June or something. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's like the basketball trophy for me. You know, yeah. it's for a Jewish girl. Well, funny story. I wasn't. I was never at the Emmys, but I was at the Directors Guild the first year that you won for the first season. It was very. Very inspiring. Thank you. Yeah, it was. It's crazy. It's crazy because we do feel like if you watch the very last moment in one of the episodes, yeah. you know, Toby is saying, "We're coming to get you. We're knocking on your door," and it feels like too much to dream that we could also right. attempt something so artsy and so wild and so true and vulnerable, and then be recognized by some of these standard bearers of the industry. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Every time I win one of those awards, I'm just like, what the heck is happening? <laughs>